Lord, we are so thankful that we can approach you, that we can come to your throne anytime we need you. And Lord, do we need you this morning. We pray that you would bless this message, that you would not just bless my mouth as I deliver the message, your message. Lord, don't let these be mere words from me, but let this be your words. But Lord, we pray that you would give us, give the hearer what they need this morning. That you would present them encouragement and challenge. But Lord, that you would not let them leave the same way that they came to this service. That they would be able to, to take your word and apply it to their life. And that you would not let us live a life for our own gain. That you would not let us live a life that, that, that is complacent in ourselves, living just for ourselves, Lord. We pray that we would come and we would lay that at your feet this morning. Bless your word. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, Philippians is a, is a wonderful book. Uh, it is a book all about joy and uh, what, what a joy it is to serve our Lord. And so what we are going to be digging into this morning uh, in, in some aspects may not be the most joyful thing ever, but it really is leading up to the most joyful thing ever, which is that our sins are forgiven. And so what I want us to think about this morning is what is a perfect life? What does it mean to live a perfect life? Uh, when we look out in our culture and our society, we see that this is the ideal that is set before us. Uh, you know, you look at your commercials, there's always good-looking people trying to sell you something. We look at politicians, there's always somebody who is trying to present their best face, and you see scandals come out, and you go, oh, this person is not perfect. You, you dig back into somebody's past history and you pull something out to try to show they are not a perfect person. But yet, we still strive to achieve this perfection of what society tells us to be and we need to live up to that standard. What does it mean to live a perfect life? And yet you see, we have this thing called cancel culture that comes out and says, no, 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 you're not perfect. Ha! Your entire life is disproven because we dug back, you know, five, six years ago and found a tweet. You are not a perfect person, therefore your entire existence is invalidated because you are not living a perfect life. What is a perfect life? Well, Paul is encouraging the Philippian church. And in, in chapter 3, he starts, uh, let's, let's just read it. Let's just dig right in. Uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write these same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself may have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I'm faultless. So Paul, right after encouraging the Philippian church to rejoice, he turns to address a heresy. He turns around and says, I've got to warn you about something. And it's amazing that he puts the, the joy rejoice next to this warning because this is going to steal your joy. There are, there's this heresy that is, is threatening the church. And so he's desiring to protect them with truth. And so he says, beware the dogs. He says, beware the evil workers, beware mutilators of the flesh. He says, beware three times, boom, boom, boom. And so he really wants to underscore this, underline this. He wants us to pay attention to this. And so it appears that there is this 
heretical teaching tracing itself back to Judaism. Uh, he doesn't reference it by name here, but when we look at other scriptures, we can, we can kind of fill in and, and try to guess as, as to what is going on. In, in other of Paul's works, he mentions Judaizers. Uh, these people called Judaizers. And they are uh, some Pharisees who had become Christians, and then they are essentially demanding that before you can become a Christian, you must convert to Judaism. We're a sect of Judaism. So as you, as you become a Christian, well, the pathway is not just through Christ, but it's through the law plus Christ. And so we're just going to put Christ on top of Judaism, and therefore, there you go. A Gentile, every Gentile must convert first to Judaism. And this includes the ceremonial rite of circumcision. And so the church in Jerusalem addresses this issue in Acts 15. They go through and they say, hey, this is an issue. We need to address this and, and really hash this out. The, but in Asia Minor, it seems they were having, this, this sect was having success in confusing the Gentile converts. And so in Jerusalem, they're, they're hashing out and figuring it out. But out there on the mission field where Paul has been for the last few years, spreading the good news of Christ to the Gentiles, there is confusion Wait, wait, wait. We have the Holy Spirit. But yet, are we subject to the whole law, all 613 laws of the Old Testament? Do we have to come under that? And that includes circumcision? And so Paul warns them, saying this is a heresy. He calls them three terms, dogs. If you think of dogs, uh, back then you have roving bands of wild dogs. You know, they'll, they'll get in your trash, they'll knock it over, they'll do stuff. You don't want to be caught out in the middle of it because these dogs might attack you. But they eat garbage. They're vicious. They might have rabies. Saw a video yesterday of a woman being attacked by a, a uh, bobcat with rabies uh, in the middle of a suburb. And so we think of this, it is not a good thing to be called a dog. It's basically saying, you, you eat the table scraps, you eat what is down here. This is not the food fit for, for people. You are eating garbage. You are eating waste. There's even the proverb that says a dog will return to his own vomit. It's not a good thing to be called a dog. And then he, he turns around and calls them evil workers. Uh, there's a similar term in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, uh, where Paul is defending himself against an attack in the Corinthians. A, a heresy had come into the Corinthians saying that Paul was not actually a real apostle, so you don't need to listen to him. And so Paul was fighting this, this belief of saying, everything Paul says is incorrect. He goes, no, 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 no. I am trying to help you. I'm trying to be with you. I really am an apostle. I have seen Jesus with my own eyes, and he has given me this directive to come to you with the gospel. This is not all false. And so then he calls them mutilators of the flesh. Um, I'm reading from the NIV, but the NASB calls it a, a false circumcision. Uh, I prefer mutilators of the flesh because I do not want to sanitize this language here. He's making a point. And so when we sanitize this language, we, we don't get what he is really saying. And so let's, let's, let's kind of dig into that a bit. He's referencing this term circumcision. So he goes, this is the point of conflict that they are having. This is the heresy they're bringing in, that you must be convert to Judaism and be circumcised. That is what they are hung up on. And so he has this, this word, root word means to cut. They're talking about the physical act of cutting flesh. And so he changes this word from just circumcision to mutilation. And thereby he is bringing in the fact that what they are doing is they are not actually in this for the ceremonial aspect of being uh, obedient to God. They are in this because they really, truly, at, the, at their heart of hearts, believe that mutilating their flesh is going to bring them closer to God. 
they have turned something that was actually meant to be obedience to God into just another way to look at their holiness. And so they're trying to bring every Gentile Christian under this control of theirs to say, no, 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 you need to jump through our hoops. You need to listen to us. And Paul is saying, no, 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 you need to listen to God. We're not going to play your games. But he says, what is so terrible about what these people are teaching? Why does he approach it with this disdain? Why does he, he attack them so much? It, he gives this the reason. But before we get there, he, he wants to affirm the Philippian Christians real quick. He wants to affirm them. And so he says, it is we who are the circumcision. We serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. They're doing an outward action, but their hearts inside are not right. We are worshiping God in spirit, in truth. We are boasting in Christ Jesus, not in the deeds that we have done out here with our flesh. We boast in Christ. It's not look at us, it's look at him. And so he says, we put no confidence in the flesh. We do not look at our good works and say, hey, look, that is enough to gain favor with God. Look at me, I'm so holy. And so he says in verse 4, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I want to put this another way. The Judaizers are teaching you must obey Christ and the Jewish law. And that completely undercuts the work of the Spirit in sanctification in your life. Because if you have outward holiness, why do you need inward holiness? Not only does it do that, it completely undercuts the glory of the cross of Christ. If I can be holy on the outside without looking at the cross of Christ, then why do I need Christ? He's saying this attack, it looks innocent. You need to convert to Judaism. Oh, that makes sense. Christianity comes from Judaism. But then he says, no, 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 there's something sinister at work here. They're pulling you away from your salvation and attaching this old dead system to it. They don't want you to put your trust in Christ. They want you to put your trust in the law. This is the same old broken system that we have gotten back into. You would still be held responsible for all 613 laws of the Old Testament Torah. If when you die, you have done more good things than bad, then maybe you have God's favor. Let me ask you, is this how we operate today? We operate with this thinking that if I do enough good things, I have favor with God. If, the good, if when I die, the good things I, that I have done outweigh the bad, if I'm a good person, then I will have favor with God and I'll get to go to heaven. Is this how we operate? Because he says, this is how we, we trick ourselves into thinking this system. If I am just, you know, playing this game just right, this game of life, then I will be able to live a perfect life and God will have to accept me. By the way, the decision of the church in Acts 15, the leadership of the church, which includes Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul was there as well, was that if even the Jews couldn't keep the law, then what, what chance do the Gentiles have of it? We were raised in the system and we still can't keep it. We were raised in the church and we still can't obey the rules of the church to stay in the favor with them. <laughs> Because if this is impossible for us, then it is impossible for them, and we should not put that on them. If God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit, then that was the only seal of approval they needed. We are trying to put God in the box. We are trying to put rules that God has not put on these people. 
if he saw fit to give them the Holy Spirit, who are we to put the law back on them? We don't need man coming behind the verge of God saying that's not enough. And so you see what they're trying to do. They're adding words to the word of God. And they want religion under their control so they can use it to be the gatekeepers of who can and cannot be saved. Oh, that's dangerous. They want to pick and choose who is not living up to their standards. And say, guess what? You're not welcome at this church. I know what you did last week. This is the past you have. You, I, I went back and I read a tweet. Hey, guess what? You used cuss word. How dare you? You will never show your face here again. And so Paul holds up himself to these standards. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. What does that mean? That means he was circumcised according to the Jewish law. That means he is in the same league as these people who are bringing this against him. He says, all right, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. That is my nationality. I am from Israel. I'm an Israelite. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin being one of the tribes that, that survived the exile. Benjamin and Judah remained obedient throughout the exile, and they got to thrive and come back. In fact, Israel's first king is from the tribe of Benjamin, and his name is Saul. And it's very possible that this apostle was named after him. A Pharisee. That is a good thing in regard to the law. He's a Pharisee. He's devout. If he has anything, he is in not just the Jewish sect. He's not just an active Jew. He is one of, you know, this denomination of the Pharisees, he's saying, you know what, I am, I am one of the most devout denominations. We really know our stuff and we really hold ourselves accountable to this stuff. But then he goes further. He, he says, these are all things that were out of my control. This is the providence of God on me that I was born where I was born. Hebrew of Hebrews. My parents are both Hebrews. They both kept the law. So I have this generational understanding, this generational faithfulness that I had no control of, but I was born with the best possible chance to be the best Hebrew ever. So what did he do with it? Verse 6, as for zeal, persecuting the church. He was, if I'm a true Hebrew, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to look at a cult and say, you know what, the best thing I can do as a proper Hebrew is to snuff this thing out. And so he's listing this here as a plus, even though for the rest of his life he would count it as a big minus. He says, look at this. I was so zealous for the Lord, I wanted to get rid of his enemies. And so he was sitting there persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless blameless. Oh, he says, I kept the law. Keep in mind, when we get to Acts 15, what is James and Peter saying? We can't keep the law. And Paul is saying, if anybody kept it, it's me. He goes, I have lived a perfect life. According to the system of Judaism, I have lived a perfect life. If anybody is going to have the right to say his good works are going to land him in God's favor, that heaven is waiting for him, it's Paul. There wouldn't be too much to say that his righteousness can get him to heaven. Nobody's more devoted. What is the point here? What, he, what is he making? That if someone is seeking fame, he had it. If someone is seeking prestige, he had it. Privilege in the Jewish community. He had it. In fact, he got the opportunity to sit there. Acts chapter 8 tells us that he was the one who signed off on the stoning of Stephen. Paul was there giving his approval. That's how much influence he had. In fact, when he has his Damascus conversion in Acts 9, he is on the road to Damascus to kill more Christians. He wants to capture them, bring them back to Jerusalem, and have them executed. That's a good Jew. 
He had a perfect life, everything you could ever want. Now, I know a lot of you grew up around here. I didn't. I do not have that honor, that privilege, that, that opportunity. Uh, I understand it is a completely different thing to be from Charleston. Like, if you aren't from Charleston, you will never be from Charleston. I've heard that before. I can say I am not even a native South Carolinian. I grew up in Kansas. I appreciate you all putting up with me. <laughs> I'm a transplant. And I'm thankful I married a South Carolina native because then I probably might not have any credibility, right? <laughs> she checked off on me. I love you. Thanks for taking a chance on, on me. That is the providence of God that we are born where we are born, in the families that we are born into. And how do you act as a proper South Carolinian according to the law of the land? Uh, there are a lot of things I didn't understand when I got down here. There's a few things I still don't understand, but I'm working through it. But if you grew up in it, you just know it. And so Paul is saying, socially, he knew how to interact with everybody. Legally, he knew how to interact with the system. According to perfection, he was able to, to have everything. He was rich in his own righteousness. And so if he was able to point at his life and say he lived it perfectly, he was the best student, the best judge, the best lawyer, the best philosopher, the best social justice warrior, the best, most passionate leader. Acts 22 even reiterates this. Again and again and again and again and again, he was rich in his own righteousness. He is a golden child. So why does he say the church has no confidence in the flesh? Because our hearts are idol factories. We tend to take our eye off the ball and put it on ourselves over and over and over again. We take our eye off the Lord and put it on ourselves. We stop focusing on his holiness, his spirit, and we start looking at our own holiness and our own spirit. There's something very wrong with trusting our own ability to be good. And so Paul has set up with a perfect life. What does he say about it? What does he think about it now that he's on the other side of meeting Jesus? Verse 7, whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ, be found in him. These are legal terms, gain and loss. I consider all that was gained to me to be lost. I have all of this stock, all of this perfect life, and guess what? It is now a loss to me. I was in the green, but now I'm in the red. I've, I've put my energy in the wrong thing. He's considered the most favorable position he could ever be in. He considered the things that have the most value for a person to obtain in this life. He considered it rubbish. He considered it garbage. In fact, if you really look at the root word, it means dung. He considered it to be feces. Everything I have ever accomplished in my entire life is dog poo. What a way to talk about his life. It's lost to me. He's moved all of his gains into the lost column. I have wasted my life, is what he has said. I have wasted my life on these things. For what? Why does he move the gains to the lost column? He says, for Christ. For Christ. For the sake of Christ. So we ask ourselves, what is gain? Gain for ourselves. Why do we try to perfect our skills? Why do we sit there and say, hey, I, I, want, I want something perfect? You look at a video game, oh, you want to 100% it, get that achievement. You look at, you know, repairing something. Oh, you want it to look as nice as possible. I will admit, try as we might, I would love to have a Sunday where we look like a perfect church. What is a perfect church? Who knows? You know, speaking of, we need tech people. We would love to have you. Because if you look at what, well, what is happening, we have little distractions, little imperfections. You know, things happen. We have... 
you know, one day I came up here and, you know, it's like this for half the service. Okay. We have feedback coming in through the audio. God bless our tech team. We can't be perfect if we tried. But we try again and again and again to present a false face to the world that is not real of the inner problems that we have. Why do we weightlift? We want to get stronger. Why do we read or study? We want to get smarter. We want to improve ourselves because we are chasing perfection of some kind. But it's rubbish. It's trash. It has no value. Paul considers his perfect life not just a loss, it is equivalent to dung. He, he takes it even further. He says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. He says, this is not just about my life. I take everything and sit there and go, of anything, the meaning of life is knowing Christ. And if I don't know Christ, I have wasted my life. Because I'm trying to, to perfect myself. And I've completely missed it. How many of us, well really, I, I want to know the reality that Paul lived this out. He didn't just consider his gains and losses. He says he actually lost it all. Because he got to know Christ and he followed him to such a degree that he did lose everything. Even down to the point of his freedom. He's, Paul is not striving to get God's attention. He is relying on this relationship to give him what he needs. He doesn't want notoriety. He says, I'm doing this out of obligation. It's no longer my life. It's Christ's. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, he, he is talking about to his disciples. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You can't take it with you when you die. Your achievements, your stuff, it's not going to matter. What's going to matter is knowing Christ. How many of us can say that we have lost everything for the sake of Christ? Say, oh, I don't have much. Well, you got something. Have you lost your relationships? Have you, have you lost? How, how many of us have lost one relationship because we declared to them that we're a Christian and they said, no, no, bye? Was it worth it? This COVID pandemic has shown a lot of us where this line is for what we are willing to lose for the sake of Christ. Are we willing to lose freedom for the sake of Christ? Because it's very clear that we are willing to lose it for the sake of ourselves. I'm putting myself in here too. I want my own safety. I want my own perfection. I want things to go well. In fact, one of the things I've been worried about, I've been worried about all of you. Why? Because <laughs> I want to be seen as a good pastor. Mm, it, it just starts chipping away at me. It's like, am I, am I okay? And then this, these, these things coming into me, guess what? Much to my disappointment, I cannot keep up with this perfection that I put on myself. Every day I'm confronted with different standards that I need to measure up to. Most of them come from myself, and I know this happens to you too. We can, you know, other people will put standards on you or you will put a standard on yourself. And guess what? I'm not called to live up to my standard. I'm not called to live up to your standard. I'm called to live up to God's standard. And what is God's standard? What is he saying in this passage? My standard is to know Christ. Know Christ. And so Paul is sitting there saying, this is, this is trash. He puts his value and he puts his money where his mouth is and he says, I have lost all of this. I'm willing to lose my freedom for the sake of Christ. I'm willing to lose my life for the sake of Christ. Knowing Christ will cost you your comfort. It will cost you something. Now, it's not bad to have things. It's not bad to have relationships. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying at some point, you're going to kind of have to come to a decision whether you're going to try to do it by your own power or you're going to rely on the Spirit of God. 
Verse 9. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes. To know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Again, he comes back and he says, I have no confidence in the flesh. I have no confidence in my own righteousness. He says, righteousness is on the basis of faith. Ephesians 2.5, just a pa few pages to the left, also reiterates this. God, who is rich in his mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sin. It is by grace you have been saved. Grace. Not your power, not, not the outward form of the circumcision, not a court keeping all 613 parts of the law. Grace. God's unmerited favor that he has poured out upon us freely while we were still sinners. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Well, I want to know Christ. I don't know the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I don't understand this. I don't understand how God is so powerful. He can raise himself from the dead, but I want to know. I want to know that knowing Christ is knowing how powerful he is. He says, I want to know that. He goes, I don't just want to know that. I want to experience that. He goes, I want to have fellowship with his sufferings. This idea that when you are hanging out with your closest family and friends, he goes, I want to be that intimate with his suffering. What a bold thing to say, Paul. He says, I want to be conformed. I want to be, you know, the, the root word morphe. I want to morph. I want to be morphed into his likeness of his death. I want to have the likeness of his death. So that somehow, by the power of God, I may be raised from the dead. And dead here is plural, the dead people. I wish I knew how to convey this. If knowing Christ is salvation, I want to know him the best I can, and I can understand him better by suffering the way he suffered. I can understand him better by, by learning about him, by having fellowship with him, by going through the things he went through, the persecution that comes after him. Yes, I will understand him better from the persecution that the world gives me. I will understand him better if I am willing to give up my junk and really devote myself to him. And so why is Paul's perfect life trash, garbage, dung? Because he focuses on the coming resurrection. He focuses on knowing Christ. He knows in the law he would still be dead. And in Christ he has already and not yet been given this resurrected life. Already his spirit is alive in Christ because the Holy Spirit lives in him. Not yet because his earthly body is still going to receive death, but he is confident that I will give it all. I will lose my life for the sake of Christ, and I will gain resurrection. What is he saying? I have not brought Christ into my life. I have died, and I live in his life. I, my life, has ceased. It's done. I live in Christ's life. Christ is not something to add to our life. We are something to be added to his death so that we may attain resurrection. He goes on, and this we'll get into next week, but I really, I, th I think it is beneficial for us. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He took hold of me, and he's not letting me go. May Christ take hold of you this morning, and may he never let you go. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for the fact that he does not mix words. We thank you that he, he, he comes at it and he says it bluntly. That we make idols out of our life trying to live it perfectly. And there's no way that we can be perfect. All have fallen short of the glory of God. All are sinners. Romans 3.23. Lord, we come to you this morning. If we've been trying to make it under our own power, we pray that you would, would let, make us stop. If there's somebody out there that's been listening to this message and they've been trying so hard to just make everything work by their own power, they've been trying to make their life perfect, they've been trying to, to amass all of this, this stuff, they've been trying to amass this, this perfect image, Lord, we pray that you would break it and that you would lead them to yourself, that they would understand what grace is, that you freely offer forgiveness if they would just come to you. If they would repent of their sin, confess themselves to you, Lord. We pray that you would make your power known to us and that we would seek your glory. We pray that you would even work on us in the uncomfortable things, that the times where we suffer. May we understand and come more, become more intimate with your suffering, Lord. But Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself and give us a hope for the resurrection that is unmatched in this county. May we seek you with such a zeal that we stop seeking ourselves. We give this all to your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.